Meanwhile, in Moscow, the other big cybersecurity company, a Russian one, Kaspersky, joins in the race to understand this virus, a virus that antivirus programs have been unable to pick up until now. Alex Gostov began his career as a hacker at the age of 15 before being recruited by Kaspersky. Today he's responsible for decoding hundreds of thousands of lines of code from Stuxnet. Uh, this is one of uh, files from Stuxnet. Of course, it looks like, I don't know, Chinese letters, yeah. But if you look in machine codes, so it's the same as language. Frankly speaking, I think it was the most sophisticated piece of malware when we've seen in maybe the last 20 years. It's spreading part, a part which use vulnerabilities, infect machines, inject code. It's very good hacker jobs. Yeah, hacker works. I think a team of five or six people, uh, they have maybe two very, very, very good hackers and most of the team it's very good engineers yeah. maybe civil engineers maybe military engineers nobody knows in early august the engineers were surprised to discover that stuxnet was designed to take control of a software created by siemens a well-known kind of software that manages industrial equipment in manufacturing and utilities This catches the engineers by surprise. Viruses are usually created simply to make easy money. The main question when we analyze most of current malware is where is money? Um, what is reason to create this? And in Stuxnet there was absolutely no idea where is money in this case. And so the origin of the attack remains a mystery. Later that month, Another major discovery is made. The virus is communicating with an outside source to update and replicate itself. These communications lead to two computer servers located in Denmark and Malaysia, servers officially dedicated to football. So then we took control of these servers, and all the connections from all the machines infected by Stuxnet were returning to one server. So we follow the traffic and are alerted to all the infected machines. And that's when we see that the infections were returning from internet addresses that are located in Iran. The engineers discovered that 60% of 100,000 infected computers are in Iran. But the online investigation yields very few clues. Just that the virus is targeting Iran, it attacks industrial software and is linked to anonymous servers. The Stuxnet mystery could have gone on for a long time had it not been for a statement given September 26, 2010 by Iran's nuclear authorities. On their website, they show that their facilities have been victim of a major cyber attack. Subject to international inspection, the Iranians have no choice but to acknowledge that their uranium production, officially for civil purposes, but perhaps military as well, had collapsed. It's a nuclear plant at Natanz that was targeted, and its valuable centrifuges acquired in recent years by the Iranians in a hard-fought struggle. The secrets of Stuxnet begin to slowly come to light. The centrifuges are not very massive. They are fairly thin tubes which revolve around the drum wall very rapidly. And the speed of centrifuges must be controlled by computer processors that have a particular function to ensure that this rate remains stable. Here is what Stuxnet does. Stuxnet tackles computer processors that control the speed of centrifuges and make them literally explode. Since these machines are fragile, once one explodes, it will cause the others to explode as well. That's why there are probably a thousand, or at least several hundred centrifuges over a certain period of time that have ceased to function as a direct result of the virus. 
At the plant, the virus managed to remain dormant for months, allowing it to mutate and then reappear, gradually sabotaging the speed of the centrifuges. All the while sending information to the operators behind their screens indicating that all was well. But the most surprising thing was how a computer virus managed to penetrate ultra-protected computers that were totally disconnected from the global internet network. Um, they had to use a worm as a delivery device, which has the advantage which they used because they wanted as many infected computers on the outside to maximize the chances that someone would walk an infected USB stick memory device into the inside, so to speak. But the worm delivery device meant that it would replicate. And so there are, at one point, there were something like tens of thousands of computer systems that had been infected by Stuxnet. And a lot of companies that had nothing to do with the Iranian nuclear program had to spend time and money to get the Stuxnet malware off their machines. If they didn't have the problem of trying to cross that gap between the, as it were, the internet-facing system and the closed system, they probably wouldn't have used a worm. And so it took several months for someone in Iran to eventually use an infected USB flash drive, consciously or not, that we will never know, and access the computer system that controls Iran's nuclear infrastructure. There was not necessarily an intent from that person to harm. To offer a similar example, the computer network at the French Ministry of Defense was compromised from the worm Conficker, although there were elements I was able to recover. The one who put the USB flash drive into the computer system had no intent to harm the computer system of the Ministry of Defense. He had no right to do so, and he was told he had no right to do so. It was simply a question of convenience to transfer a document. So there you go, the mobile digital devices have become so commonplace that he did it without giving it a second thought. According to some estimates, the Stuxnet virus might have set Iran's bomb-making abilities back two years. A simple virus damaged a nuclear program that had the world up in arms. In short, an ordinary USB flash drive just might have avoided possible Israeli airstrikes against Iran. And it doesn't stop there. There's a very important psychological message vis-à-vis -vis Iran. There's the physical impact of Stuxnet. A thousand centrifuges unable to function within a matter of just hours or days. There's also a political message, which is very important. We can return at any time without you ever noticing, and you won't even realize that we are there. Why? Because Stuxnet makes the system believe that everything is operating normally. I think that this political psychological dimension of Stuxnet is perhaps even more significant than the actual physical damage that was caused to the Iranian program. It's possible to engender a feeling of being penetrated, a feeling that you don't know what's inside your machine. And it's that doubt that your machines are doing what you want them to do that I think can be very effective. Do the Iranians think that they have cleaned it out entirely? Do they have 100% confidence in that? Well, if they don't, you know, what, think about the process by which they go from, well, let me stop there. Let me just... Yeah, that was, that was interesting, so... No, no, I'm going to stop there. Okay. Martin Lebicki might have said just a little too much. He is responsible for the Pentagon's cyber warfare strategy, so he is very well informed. We might not have heard the last of Stuxnet. The creators of the virus are still hidden behind two football servers. And nobody has so far claimed responsibility for this cyber attack. There's only four or five countries in the world that could build something like Stuxnet, and the U.S. is one of them. But there's no other proof. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the Israelis, uh, the British certainly um, have the capability. A few other countries are developing this kind of capability, but right now there is no conclusive proof one way or the other. Rumors and leaks to the press emphatically point to Israel and the United States. But the fog of war, even more present than in conventional warfare, is a real factor. Yet one thing is certain. 
For the first time, a new weapon, once confined to military laboratories, has now been used on the ground, and that changes everything.